Welcome to the Financial Freedom Mastermind Group Podcast. Here we're all about breaking free from the 40 to 50 year work grind and accelerating our journey towards financial freedom. Join us every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern as we explore different types of investments that can fast track your path to financial independence. We serve as a hub for connecting with fellow members during our sessions so you can share successes, ask questions, and keep the momentum going. Good evening, everyone. This is Niyi Adewale, host of the Akaba Home Financial Freedom Mastermind podcast. And I'm so excited to join you on this Wednesday here at the end of July. And I wanted to kick this one off. It's going to be an open session, but I wanted to kick this one off with talking about a topic that's been brought up over the past couple of weeks and I've had in one-on-one conversations. And it's around how to or when to move from your current career, which may be draining your energy, which may not be your passion, and move into something else, whether it be doing something full-time real estate related, moving into a career that's going to pay less but fulfill you more. And there's many ways to go about this. For me personally, some people look at me and say that I'm very risky because I put a lot of money into different real estate ventures, things of that nature. Other people would look at me and say, hey, I'm not risky enough. I'm risk adverse. I personally think that I'm risk adverse in the way that I kind of go about my investing and things of that nature. And so when you look at making that jump into a different career path, I'm always a fan of using your career and the knowledge and the social capital that you've built up wherever you're located to help you transition to the next one. And what I mean by that is some people want to completely throw away, you know, and burn all the ships and just jump to the next career without having anything kind of set up. I'm a fan of working both simultaneously, building up the side hustle that could be the second career, and then making the jump once it gets to a point where you're so busy that you're working around the clock and you've got to make a decision. I had a conversation with an individual the other day who works upwards of 80 hours a week in their job, literally, like no joke. And so they have no time to do anything else. And they were thinking like, man, I just want to jump into something else that's going to fulfill me a bit more. Yes, I'm going to make a heck of a lot less, but at least I could be able to spend time with my family and things of that nature. And my whole thought process when we hopped on the phone was, ah, you could make that jump and it's going to be a really big adjustment. But what if you just took uh, another role that's similar to what you're doing at a different company where it's a little bit less strenuous and there's less dependent on you, but you're still making a high income. And then with the extra hours that you have, start to build up the side hustle until it becomes big enough that you can move into it full time. That's literally what I did. I can tell you that I didn't make the jump from the W-2 to full-time entrepreneur lightly. I was in the W-2 corporate world for close to eight years. And during that time, I built up a large real estate portfolio of 30 plus units, right? And I was just systematically buying, systematically buying, systematically putting money away and kind of saving for that point. And what really was the impetus for me was not the savings or the real estate income. It was the fact that I was building up a side hustle of short-term rental management, as well as being a realtor and getting my license out here and having that build to a point where I was literally working 24-7 and it wasn't sustainable and I had to make a decision. And at that point, I knew what my heart and passion was telling me was to move into full-time real estate. And so it was an easier decision. I much prefer you do something like that as opposed to, hey, I hate this job. I'm going to jump away from this and just jump into something else. Please try to build something up. I highly recommend that before jumping ship. But I will jump off of my, my, my the pedestal and, and stop the soliloquy. This is going to be an open session tonight. Please feel free to throw any questions in the chat and or to join live. Remember, if you want to join live, you got to do it from a computer. But I'm excited to connect with some individuals tonight and kind of see what you guys got going on. And while we're waiting for some chat questions to come in and or people to join live, just a heads up, I will not be hosting the call next week. I'm actually going to be getting married, which I'm excited about. So I'm going to be out of commission for next week and a bit of the following, but we'll resume this on August 12th. Don't quote me on that. Not next week, but the following week, we'll resume our sessions. Do not be shy. What you guys got? What questions? What you thinking about? Emmanuel, I appreciate the congratulations, man. Yes. And so this is an amazing question. So I'm going to read this one out loud. 
Want to know your thoughts? How much of an influence will your existing portfolio size and experience have when trying to break into the commercial real estate investing to scale portfolios more efficiently? And commercial real estate is defined as multifamily that's five units or larger. And I would say tremendous, tremendous amount, because literally when you start going to the larger units, if you've had practice with, you know, duplex, triplex, quadplex, or even single family, you're going to do the same process, just expanding it larger. And now you've got economies of scale. They're going to help you bring down some of the costs and be able to do it more efficiently. And so I like to say that a lot of people that I talk to on a, a week to week basis, at least a couple of people are always trying to, you know, go after something huge. They're like, Hey, I want to see if I can pull together everybody's money so I can go buy, you know, a hundred unit. And then we're going to retire on that and figure out how to manage it. And that's a tall task, especially if you've never owned real estate before or built a, a smaller portfolio to where, you know, okay, here goes how I put together a contract to make sure that the work's going to get done. Hey, here goes vendors I can trust in the area, things of that nature. And so when you're even going to other people to raise money, when you are going to the bank to ask for the funds to even close on the property, when you were talking to the seller to let them know that, hey, I am going to close on this, I'm going to move forward, having experience with smaller portfolio does help you get to that next level. I can tell you my first property was a triplex, right? Now, I think I've told the story multiple times. I bought a house hack in Louisville, Kentucky, bought a triplex, lived in one unit, ran the other two out. And then I kept going from there. And then the next large purchase that I made was a 12 plex, which is considered commercial. And the experience that I had from the triplex, the different contexts that I met and the different contractors that helped me kind of put that one together, were able to immediately jump in and get that 12 plex going. And it's the same thing when you look at going bigger. For example, I think we've mentioned it on here a couple of times too, but I'm working on a syndicate. We're building 105 townhome units in Louisville, as well as 200 self-storage units. And if this was the first project that we were doing out there, I'd be shaking in my boots, man. It'd be it'd be pretty scary, right? Because you wouldn't know like who is telling the truth, who you can trust, who you can work with, things of that nature, because you haven't built a rapport with anybody. But I've invested heavily in Louisville, so I've got contacts. My realtor, who's my partner, invests heavily around that area, so she has contacts. And the project manager and the construction team that we have on site knocking it out this is not their first project with us. They've worked with us on smaller projects, but we've seen the breadth and scale of what they can do. We know the type of work they can get, they can put together. And now we feel comfortable moving forward with them to knock out a bigger project. So I hope that answered the question, but yes, it can absolutely help uh, having a smaller size portfolio, help you crack into the larger size. What else you got? Any other questions or anybody want to join in live? One other piece I'll mention too, is I'm actually working to build out that team here. So in Louisville, I was investing for seven years before we took on, well, yeah, yeah, seven years before we took on this bigger project, right? So it builds up a lot of contacts. I've only actually been in Atlanta, Georgia for like two and a half years, right? And so I'm still working to build up a larger team here. But this property that I purchased up in Snellville, the fourplex, is allowing me to test out a lot of the guys. I've done some flips. I've landed on flips. I've seen different contractors, things of that nature. But now it's a property that I'm going to buy, hold, and keep. And so I'm able to see the team at work swing by. I was just up there yesterday to check out the work and it's moving smoothly. I think they're going to be done by Wednesday. And so it's good to, to kind of see that piece. And it's going to allow us to start to build a team to go bigger, right? So this is a fourplex. This is the max you can get for a small multifamily. Maybe the next one's an eight plex, a 12 plex, 16 plex, just depends on the deal. What else you got? One piece I will talk about, and this is where I spend the majority of my conversation, especially with new clients, is getting over that fear of purchasing that first property, right? I still remember to this day, you know, going through the process of buying my first property. And I can tell you that three days before and two weeks after, I could not sleep. I was like, definitely having some, some fear, like, hey, did I just throw all my savings away? I'm not going to get it back. This house is going to take me down. I still remember growing up in a household that went through the 08 crash, right? And, and kind of what that did to us. I'm like, man, is this going to bankrupt me? Things of that nature. That was all thoughts that were running through my head when I purchased that first one. But what helped is thinking about the long runway that I had. It was like, hey, okay. 
if I completely mess this up, I can still go back into the W2 world and just build, you know, the normal way through 401k, things of that nature. That's that's the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, this thing doesn't only sells for what I bought it for, or maybe less. I lose a lot of money and I've got to continue working that W2 until retirement age. But what about that best case scenario, you know, or that that optimal scenario? Optimal scenario is, hey, I figure this thing out. It grows in value. I'm able to continue buying more investments and it allows me the opportunity to reach financial freedom a lot sooner than I would going down that normal pathway. And the way I look at it in in terms of an analogy, when you look at life versus even like a board game, right? I love Monopoly. Anybody that's been at the house knows that I love chess and Monopoly. Monopoly is a, a fun game to play with family, things of that nature. And one of the things that rings true in Monopoly, as well as the real world, is if you're on that board playing and all you're doing is going around the board to collect your $200, you're probably going to lose the game, right? Because that 200 collection is not going to help you when people start building houses and you got to pay out money to everybody. And I view that as your W-2 salary or income, right? There's some high income earners. Yes. You know, if you're a CEO of a company, maybe you're good, but 99% of people are not the CEO of the company. So they're making a lot less than that person. And so if you're just going around the board, collecting a paycheck every two weeks, it's going to be very hard for you to be able to quote unquote, retire early, travel the world, things of that nature, and have other options than just working that W-2. However, if you start to buy some pieces around that board, and maybe you buy, you know, just one or two and, and a little bit more, and then you start building houses and, and updating and upgrading and things of that nature, that's how you really win that game of Monopoly. And that's honestly how you win in the game of life, right? The money that we have in the bank accounts right now over the past couple of years has been eroded away with inflation. That being said, if you put that same money into certain stocks or into real estate, things of that nature, it's kept pace or beat inflation to where you're making money on that and able to kind of continue to accelerate. And so that's one of the things that helps me get over the fear is just thinking long term, hey, five years from now, I'm going to be happy that I own this asset. Yes. So let me just buckle down, figure out how to acquire one and hang on to it. This is a great question. I'd like to hear what made you become a real estate agent among the pool of real estate professions when you decided to move out of your W-2. Were there any other real estate professions that you considered, i.e. property management, appraiser, etc.? This is an amazing question, and I think everybody should really pay attention to this. So I'm a fan of utilizing the same skills that you're learning within your W-2 outside of it. And so in my W-2, I was a sales rep. Right. I was in medical device sales. I've made my way up from basically an intern to selling contracts and portfolios and, and supplies to selling medical devices to moving into a director role where I troubleshooted any issues that are top 10 hospitals in the southeast. Right. Top 10 hospital systems in the southeast. But all of that revolved around sales, customer service, things of that nature. And so when I look to, hey, what could I do within the real estate profession? I focused on the skills that I've been working on and getting paid for up to that date. And so sales is comfortable with me. I can tell you I started off, you know, way back in the day selling Cutco knives, going door to door, doing those those weird presentations where we cut a rope and, and cut a penny and all that stuff. That was me. I sold automatic data processing, which is like the, the checks, the HR and payroll systems that most Americans are paid through and, and don't really pay attention to, and then moved into healthcare sales. And so real estate sales was a natural combination of two things that I love. One, sales, and two, real estate. And the background that I have in investing, in my mind, I was like, man, I believe I can help some people. And what I learned, and the reason I believe that is because I would have so many conversations with individuals that were buying houses, you know, in Georgia and other states and trying to coach them through what I would do personally, you know, when I was investing in Louisville. Like, hey, no, instead of offering you know, 10K below asking, just give them their asking and ask for 10K toward closing. Why? Because it's going to allow you to have 10K in your pocket because you're not going to pay your closing costs and you're going to be able to finance that 10K and eliminate the closing, keep the 10K in your pocket. And that 10K equates to like $50 a month. So it doesn't mean much, right? So those type of things were things that I had thought through and I had done in my own investing career. And I knew like, hey, if I got my license, I could help others go through this as well. Now, it's funny you mentioned, did you think about property management or appraiser? So 
I did not think about appraiser. Property management, I used to manage my own properties in Louisville until I moved to Boston. And it was just, there was a lot going on trying to close some deals out there. And we were building units. And I just couldn't handle it. So I moved it to property management. But moving down to Georgia with these short-term rentals and midterm rentals, I did start to build up a property management team. And now we manage a little over 20 properties. And so that was the piece that helped accelerate the the move to full-time real estate, because I was projecting that I would not move into full-time real estate until 2025, right? I was thinking, okay, you know, by 2025 or December 31st of 2024, I want to make the jump to full-time real estate because the business should ramp up by then. I wasn't depending on the short-term rental management business growing the way that it did. It went from managing just my two to managing my two plus two others to managing eight to realizing, hey, I got to build a team, to building that team and now managing 20, close to 25. And that is significant income that comes in that was able to accelerate the timeline. When I started to look at the numbers, I was like, okay, this can actually act as a base. And then the real estate agent piece can act as the bolus that helps continue to allow me to invest, continue to allow me to put money away for savings, things of that nature, and, and kind of continue the lifestyle. Not to mention one of the other calculations I did was, you don't have to make as much as a full-time real estate professional, right? At the W-2, I built up a long career or long in, in some people's eyes, right? Eight years and, and moved into five different roles and kept moving up the ladder, up the ladder, up the ladder. I had good social capital there. And so I was making a good amount, right? And to replace that exact amount would have been a, a tall task. But because I'm moving into the real estate professional space, there's so much depreciation, so many updates I did to these units across the years where I was not allowed to actually take that tax benefit. It just kept rolling over, rolling over, rolling over because I was a high income earner. But in talking to my CPA, I can take a lot of that immediately as soon as I declare real estate professional. And so when I did the numbers, I could make half of what I was making at the W-2 and still, quote unquote, make the same because most of my taxes would write off all the, the 40% I was paying, right? Or 37%, whatever, whatever that high tax bracket is, right? And so that was a piece that helped me make that decision. And to answer your question, yeah, I didn't really consider any others. It was the real estate professional piece because I knew like, hey, I could have some success here if I just buckle down and focus. And the one thing that I love about this, by the way, is when I was up in Boston and we closed a couple of the big deals, I started to realize I didn't have to go out and really chase down other deals as hard, right? Like they would kind of come to me because they're like, hey, we got a referral from these guys. And so what I like about the real estate business and real estate profession is literally everybody is at some point going to interact with real estate, whether you're renting it, whether you're purchasing it, whether you're an investor, things of that nature, you interact with it on the daily. And if you do a good job with the individuals around you, it can build very quickly and it can turn into a referral thing to where people are like, hey, if you want to go work with somebody, go work with the Acaba home team, go work with me, go work with Liban, Deanna, Naira, Erica, things of that nature. Right. And so that's kind of a long winded way of saying why I chose that piece. And then the property management helped. But guys, I think it's a little bit light this week. I appreciate you for joining and I hope to see you in about two weeks. We have a couple guests lined up. I know we were supposed to have Farley back on last week, but we're still having technical issues. So we're going to figure that piece out. We're going to have some guests lined up for August. Again, next week is going to be an off week. And then we're going to kick it back off in the second half of the year and, and start having a couple more guests join us, tell us about their stories, learn from them, and really see if we all can't achieve our goals before the end of 2023. I hope you have an awesome night and I can't wait to catch up with you here in about two weeks. Everybody be safe. I will see you later.